Hello, welcome back to Sharks Happen. My name is Hal, I'm your host, going over shark attacks from the 1900s till present, mostly large sharks. Today we're gonna to go through the attacks that inspired the book Jaws, and we're also gonna go over the most famous escape from Alcatraz, where three of the four men that tried to escape got off the island. Uh, we'll get into that escape a little bit, we'll get into what probably happened to the men that left, and then I'll have a, uh, some stats, some attack stats as far as attacks and fatalities, in a handful of locations around the world just to let you know what's going on out there and who's getting hit worse with fatalities through the attacks. So I hope you stay with us to the end and we're going to start out over in Beach Haven, New Jersey. The date July 1st or 2nd of 1916. Charles Van Zant is at the beach with a bunch of other people. There is a pandemic going on in New York. A person per hour is dying on average. So people have flocked to the beaches in New Jersey to get away, it sounds like. Uh, the extra busy beaches probably lead to these uh, two attacks that we're going to cover that were out in the ocean, actually. So the first one is in Beach Haven. Uh, Charles Van Zant is either 17 or 23 years old. And I've heard that he is either 50 feet or 150 feet out into the water, but both say that he's in chest deep water. Um, some reports say he was playing with the dog in the surf. Um, I didn't see that in the older stories though. I went back to the newspapers and went back to 1916, the week after all the attacks and read what most of them had to say. And I couldn't find much about a dog. I don't know if I found anything about a dog in there. So. So he is out there, it's five o'clock in the afternoon and Charles Van Zandt is in chest deep water. Other bathers start yelling a warning to him suddenly and he doesn't have much room to go. There's a shark bearing down on him. He starts making his way for shore. Sounds like he was trying to walk his way into shore because when he was bit, he was still on his feet. Um, I would think that he would be swimming, you'd be bit, you know, not on your feet, but he gets bit in his leg, in the thigh. Uh, it sounds like the right thigh, and he screams out for help. People can see him struggling, but they can't see the shark. Um, you can see part of the body of the shark and, and the fin, but it doesn't really bring itself up out of the water. Uh, a gentleman that's, a, that's a, on the beach that is an Olympic swimmer, he swims out to help him. He gets to him and he is unconscious in the water. So he grabs onto him and starts making his way back with them. The beachgoers make a chain to help him. So they get out to him with their chain and they bring him in quicker that way. Uh, some reports are that the shark was still hanging on when they got him into shallows and finally let go. Um, I'm of the belief that you know the shark was probably gone as soon as that swimmer got out to him, as usual, as usually happens, and uh, they were able to get him into shore, but he ends up passing away from his wounds. He had a big chunk of his thigh taken, just removed, and uh, I believe it, it did sever his femoral artery. So. He ended up bleeding and uh, bleeding and passing away. Uh, somebody that was on the beach that got a decent look at the shark told his father that he thought it was a nine foot, about 500 pound great white. Um, but that's the only report I've seen on somebody identifying it. And I'm not sure, too sure how reliable that is, who, who even was there to see it. So uh, that's our story of Charles Van Zant. Um, now we go up, up 45 miles from there. We're going north of Beach Haven to Spring Lake. And the date on this one is Ju July 6th of 1916. And Charles Bruder, he is 28 years old and he is 400 feet offshore. He is known, he's a very good swimmer, known for swimming a lot further out than friends and he's done so on this occasion too. His friends are at least 100 feet shy of him. He's out all by himself out in deep water. Uh, they, they tried warning him all the time not to be swimming out in that deeper water like that, but this time it didn't go well. Um, shortly after he gets out 400 feet, people hear a scream, they see him struggling, and they see this shark. This shark's on top of the water, breaching itself, they say. It's taking its head and body out of the water at times, making repeated attacks on him. Uh, it takes a boat probably a couple minutes to get over to him and when it arrives uh, Charles Bruder is still conscious and he tells him my legs it's bit my legs off so the guy grabs onto him and pulls him into the boat and sees that one of his feet are gone just above the ankle uh, the other leg is bitten off just below the knee and he's got other bites to him he ends up with a 
uh, some flesh removed from his torso. I don't know which side of his torso, and it sounds like defensive wounds to his hands. He goes unconscious before they get him into shore and passes away. Um, before or when he gets to shore, he dies from blood loss. Of course, it's severed arteries everywhere. Uh, terrible attack on him. Some of the women that were on shore that were watching it, one of them yelled out that it looks like a red canoe. The, red, the canoe just overturned. She thought it was a red canoe that overturned when it was actually blood. When they realized it was blood, they, a bunch of the women fainted. Like I said, the beach was packed for this one too, probably leading to you know, the sharks being in the area. Um, but the fact he's out hundreds of, hundreds of feet, 100, 200 feet past everybody is not a good thing. Um, so that's our attack on Charles Bruder. It's a fatality. He ends up passing away, doesn't regain consciousness. And now we have a week before, almost a week before the next incident. If you go up the continent about 30 miles and then you wrap around to the left, then you'll see the opening of Matawan Creek. And a shark, their theory is that the shark went up, went around, and entered into that. Um, that's not my theory. but. Uh, so a shark enters this creek, and this is a skinny creek. It's, it's not wide at all where the attack happened. It's only 35 feet across, and I think that might have been at one of these bigger openings where it looks like a watering hole type thing, and then the rest of it looks maybe, you know, 15, 20 feet across. It could be 35 feet across in the, in the main channel, but it just doesn't look like it. So um, it's, it's on July 12th and uh, retired Captain Cottrell, he is walking across the trolley bridge and he looks down as he's walking across the bridge and he can see this large shark is swimming up the river, away from the ocean, which is 10 miles away. Uh, they're 10 miles from the mouth of the ocean and this shark just goes under the bridge. He goes running into Matawan, yelling that there's a shark in the, in the river. Nobody's paying any attention to this because they're so far from the river, uh, so far from the ocean, and it sounds like they've never seen a large shark in there before. Um, so at this point, he's in there telling the town about the shark that's in the water. There's boys that it sounds like are in, they're in a 35 foot wide part of the river and they're swimming. And one of them is Lester Stillwell. There's multiple kids in there swimming, but one of them's Lester Stillwell. I believe he's 12. I've seen 12, 11, 13. So about 12 years old, but he's swimming in there and all of a sudden he kind of starts struggling and he gets pulled under the water. Kids not knowing what went on, they ran up and, because they couldn't see a shark, they ran up and they ran into town telling them that, that uh, Lester is having you know, trouble. He's, he's drowning in the water. So Stanley Fisher, 24 years old, I believe it is, he's one of the men in the town. He is a big guy, uh, over six feet, 220 pounds, a big fella. He runs down to the to the uh, creek, he's gonna help find this kid. He's not gonna have Lester now. He's thinking that he's having an epileptic, epileptic fits because he has epilepsy. And probably everybody in town is thinking the same thing, not even putting the two and two together of Cottrell telling them about a shark and this kid disappearing. Uh, a couple different versions here. Some say that Stanley Fisher got down there and got into a boat with another and then they searched with oars at first and then they donned tights to go swimming, two of them, and they started diving for like a half hour. It was, a, one of the reports is it took an hour to find, finally locate the kid. Uh, but eventually Stanley Fisher is com continually diving down. A couple different reports, one says that he got out and then when he dove back in, that's when the attack happened. But most of them say that when he was diving down, diving down, uh, he finally was at the opposite side of the bank where everybody was lined up on the side of the town. He's at the opposite side of the bank. Some people said that they saw that he was holding probably Lester Stillwell's body as he was getting up there. And when he's bit in the leg, so something grabs his leg and he screams and some people say he dropped the body right there into the water. Um, but yes, he gets bit on the opposite side before he gets up out of the water, it grabs onto his leg and now he's fighting for his life. There's a boat that comes over and it's slapping the water with the paddle trying to scare that shark off. Finally, uh, Stanley's released, but only by the shark taking most of his calf with it. Uh, he has a huge, just terrible wound to his calf. Uh, falls into the beach. He falls unconscious at first. So they take him and they get 
the Stanley Fisher, they take them up to the train station. There's a two hour wait for the train to get there. The train finally gets there. He gets on the train. Now on the train ride, that's two and a half hours plus to get to the hospital. He's telling uh, the medical workers what actually happened. Um, he said that his leg, when he was in there, his foot had kicked the body of Stillwell and that he grabbed the, the, the boy and took the kid out of the shark's mouth and that's when the shark bit his leg. Um, so it doesn't sound like he stood up with his, he did have Lesser Stillwell in his hands, but he never stood up with him before he was bitten by the shark and then started trying to fight his way off. He ends up passing away just before he hits the operating table, which is just sad as could be. Uh, they passed up multiple stops to try to get there, the train did but they were just a little bit too late to be able to help him. And I don't know how you'd, you know, maybe amputate the leg. I don't know how you'd help somebody with that much of damage. I guess you would have to amputate and then save them that way. Now, as they're dealing with Stanley Fisher, taking him up to the train, people are running down the banks of the river, warning people to get out of the water that might be in there. And they get about a half mile down river from the ocean. So further from the ocean, about a half mile from where the attacks happened and they see Joseph Dunn and a couple of his friends in the water. They tell them to get out of the water. So Dunn and his friends are making their way out. Joseph Dunn is the last one to get there to get up himself up out of the water. It sounds like it was a ladder he was climbing up. Um, but either way, he's making his way out just before he's out of the water. Shark grabs him by the leg and it sounds like it grabbed him just a mid, mid chin and scraped all the way down through his toes. Uh, it sounds like it kept it clamped and he was able to drag his foot out of the shark's mouth. Uh, the damage that was done to his leg made them think that they might have to amputate. Uh, it sounds like they, they didn't have to amputate and he was able to survive that. So he's the only survivor out of those five attacks that happened within that 10, 11 day period. Uh, they did catch a white shark, seven foot, seven inches long, I do believe, that had human remains in it. So one of them's a white shark. So that I think was probably one of the two off of the, you know, the open ocean, either at Beach Haven or Spring Lake. I'm thinking Spring Lake because of the way the shark stayed on top of the water and kept attacking Charles Bruder like that. I'm thinking that was the white. The other one, we don't know what it is. So I'm going to put one down uh, attack and a predation attempt by a white, an attack and not a predation, which would be Charles Van Zandt. We don't know what kind of shark. And then the other three, two predation attempts, um, one, one non-predation attempt, although it probably isn't a predation attempt. That shark was out to eat anything it was getting. So we'll probably put three predation attempts to a bull shark. Um, word was that was about a 10 foot shark. And somebody said that they could see white on its belly as it was in the water. But, you know, if that shark is dark on top and light gray on the bottom, that's going to come across like that too. So I'm not too sure about that. I'm thinking this is definitely a bull shark. Uh, being in brackish water just 10 miles from the ocean, that had to be brackish water. So I'm thinking a bull shark got in there and ended up doing that damage. They went ahead and... Uh, dynamited the whole area. They caught that one shark, but they were never able to find another shark with the remains in it. I think this was done by three separate sharks, and uh, that's how I'm going to put it down. And that's our story of this, the Jaws attacks. Okay, now we head over off the coast of California to San Francisco Bay. We're going to the rock, uh, Alcatraz Island, the the hardest penitentiary to get out of that the U.S. had at the time. Um, it could hold 300, and 300 plus individuals. They normally kept it down to 250. I have heard that there was the highest uh, amount of guards to prisoner ratio on that island. Uh, they had the island was set up as a fortress and you had 50 degree water surrounding it that very rough because the water is either hauling outside the bay or hauling in the bay with the, with the currents that you have and they're pretty rough currents, two over two knots or, or, or two knots. So it's a pretty strong current and without something to help you get to shore, it's gonna be a difficult thing. So these guys, the Anglin brothers, will start out with John Anglin and Clarence Anglin. They were um, bank robbers, I do believe, and they were both in, I think it was Leavenworth. I know one of them was in Leavenworth and they were transferred out of their prison because they were trying to escape. So they sent them to The Rock. The Rock holds the hardest criminals. There was uh, a 
Capone was there, Machine Gun Kelly was there. So the worst criminals go there and so do escape people. Uh, if you're an escape artist, you're sent to the rock. So that's what happened to the Anglin brothers and they run into Frank Lee Morris when they first get there. Over a year before this uh, 1962 escape, they started planning this. They also ran into a fourth person who claims he's the mastermind of it, Alan West. Uh, he actually had janitorial duties and it was his room pushing. He was on like a third floor, which they don't use the cells in. And he would purposely push the dirt from that third floor down onto the guards that were walking around guard, uh, checking on the cells so that he was able to put up blankets. They were able to put up sheets to block off those cells so that the dirt wouldn't come down. But what they did was they used that as the area to put all the tooling they made, all the things they gathered. We're all just sitting up there right up in the open with guards walking across there, but none able to see it because they allowed them to hang these things for two months. They allowed them to hang these sheets up there, which basically assisted them and made it able for them to escape in the first place. Um, the Anglin brothers, one of them in their cell, they had a little vent, about three by six. And they took and they cut a big opening, big enough for you to get through. And they did this with first at, uh, with spoons and then they made whatever they could as chisels. Uh, some say that they did this during uh, music, uh, music time. At the end of the night, every day, they would be able to play music in their cells. And they said that that masked it, but I, I don't think that's what it was. There, they said that there was an additional uh, construction being done to a wing to open it up at the same time and that was masking the pounding and the chiseling they were doing. Um, that once they got that big hole opened up there they had made a fake wall so they made a big chunk painted and everything of what looks like the same wall that they have and then it's recessed four inches to have that little uh, that little vent in the corner of it so they would just pop that in place and make it through their searches until they uh, until it was time to go. Um, it sounds like Alan West did not do this. He was already out doing his brooming, his sweeping, so he already had his way out. He didn't have to go out through the wall to go up and do his work like the others were doing. He could do it without doing that and he never finished digging his hole before the escape was taken place and this ended up making him the fourth guy that didn't make it off the island where the other three did. Uh, the Anglin brothers on June 11th of 1962, the Anglin brothers and Frank Lee Morris, um, they took paper mache heads that they had made and they also had hair on them which was real hair because Alan West would pick up hair at the barber shop and put it in his pocket. So they were able to make real hair on these paper mache dummies stuffed them underneath the blanket, put the blankets, bundled them up, and you know, as the guards were walking by, they couldn't tell. Uh, they weren't caught till the next morning because they weren't standing at their cell when they were supposed to line up for, uh, for bed check, I guess. And uh, so that's how they ended up caught. But the thing is, is they snuck out, they went up, and they went up onto that place that's hidden by the sheets. They collected a big raft. They collected the three of the four homemade life jackets. They made life jackets out of um, a bunch of raincoats that Alan West was able to acquire uh, from, you know, they don't, they obviously didn't keep track of the rain jackets because a bunch of them disappeared and they made the raft and their, and their life jackets out of it and they had it stored up there along with all the tools that they had made to, to be able to do this escape from in the, in the, in the first place and they also had up there uh, uh, an accordion that they used that actually was worked as the pump to pump up their rafts. So they went up there, um, they had one opening that they still had to bust the bars through and that would free them up to the roof. They got through that, collected the raft, collected their, uh, their accordion pump and their life jackets and they made their way to the roof. From the roof they made their way down and onto the edge of the water. That's where they blew up the raft, if it even inflated. I mean, this is something that they just made, so there's no telling. It's not like they were able to test this thing out. So they supposedly blow this raft up right next to there. They have paddles, just big wooden board with a wooden board there that they use as paddles, and they had their life jackets, and off they went. They are off the island, the three of them. Now, Alan West is stuck trying to get his stuff open. I've 
seen a report that he did get through, got up, got his life jacket, and got up to the roof. Once he saw that everybody was gone, he went back down to his cell and just waited to be in trouble because he had a hole right there uh, that he couldn't do anything about, you know, that he had gotten through the walls and, you know, then up to the roof from. So he knew he was going to be in trouble. And the next morning, of course, you know, they don't line up and, uh, there's a big search of the whole the whole complex, and at the same time, they're starting to interview people. And the only person that really cooperates at all is Alan West, who has a hole himself and his, so they know he was part of this deal. And he tells them everything they know. He's the one who tells them that he's the he's the brains of the operation, which I don't think the brains of the operation is going to wait till last minute to get them their access to getting out. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't think he was the brains. Um, one of the other guys had to have been, I, I would think, he just was the one that was out sweeping and taking care of all that and telling them what they needed and how to get it and helping them acquire everything. But I don't think he was the brains in the operation. Either way, he's stuck there. The other three get off the island now. Um, they find life jackets in a few different spots. Uh, one's over by, uh, I believe it is Angel Beach or Angel Island. Another one is over on the mainland of San Francisco and they find, I believe it was the raft floating underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. So it was making its way out to the, you know, by itself. It was floating its way out into the uh, open ocean. So, you know, what I think has happened is they all got into the raft, got a little bit off that island and went down into that water. And instead of saving their life and swimming back to that island, back to that, you know, the treatment they get there, they tried to make their way somewhere else. And uh, that isn't going to work in that freezing cold water. There's only been one person that um, actually left the island that hit dry land that they know of. And, you know, he wasn't even in dry land. By the time he, it's so over an hour swim, they had, those prior escapees had made floating devices so that they could kick their way. One of them succumbed to hypothermia in the water and drowned. The other one made it to the shallows, made it actually up onto the beach, but not out of the water because his legs didn't work. Uh, the hypothermia was so bad that his legs wouldn't work when he made it there, and he was basically just laying in the water when they found him the next day. Uh, so very cold water, very tough to be able to swim their way out of there. And another thing is, is on Alcatraz, they kept the water in the showers unusually warm. They kept it warmer than normal because they didn't want anybody to uh, acclimate themselves to cold water to be able to swim off that island. Uh, people have made the swim in them, you know, since then, but some are wearing wetsuits, others are putting some kind of grease on them that helps keep them warm. I mean, when you're going from being in a prison, you ain't going to have any of those assists. So uh, very difficult to get out of there. I think they passed away uh, in 1986. Clarence, uh, Clarence England's grandson, Clarence England, is in jail himself for armed robberies or some kind of uh, theft. And he tells the story that his, his grandfather actually survived, lost three toes, uh, spent his life the last 10 years, the next 10 years of his life after the escape in Iowa with family. Uh, but I find that hard to believe. They had them under very close surveillance for 15 years after the escape as far as the family members and associates that are with them. I don't think that that was going to happen. I think if they survived, um, they would end up in some third world country hiding out. There was reports of a boat being halfway between Angel Island and uh, the Rock that night of the escape and one of the guards had said yeah i saw the boat sitting there and it didn't have lights on and then all of a sudden it turned lights on and went and went around the bay and went out underneath the golden gate out into the open ocean uh there was like i said some higher up criminals in there one of them was um somebody from south america that was kind of like a you know one of those I don't know, drug lords or whatever. So he could have helped them out and got a boat there. You never know, but I would say, you know, chances are that that uh, these people, all three, drowned and, you know, were scavenged by whatever ate them down in the water. I don't think any of them survived. They had, you know, they were running around even to Brazil checking into sightings of these guys, and none of them ever pan out. I would think that they all ended up perishing in that cold water. That's our story of Alcatraz, and we'll get to the end of the show. Okay, now before we get into what were you thinking or why weren't you thinking, um, I wanted to go over some stats. I was looking at some of these attacks, and I'm 
I was wondering how many fatalities have actually happened in Florida. So that's the first thing I did. I looked at attacks in Florida, just under a thousand that they call unprovoked. Uh, of course, there's a stack of them that are invalids and some are unknown, but I'm just going with their unprovokes. 980 or so unprovoked attacks just off of Florida. Uh, 49. That's the number of fatalities I find out of that 1,049 uh, fatalities. Uh, Ten of those I just threw in that are sea disaster and invalid. Uh, like I said, there's a, maybe a couple dozen that say unknown where they don't know whether they lived or died or whatever. I didn't look into those to see what they are. I'm just going by their numbers they have. So that's a 5% rate if you go by the the 49 that I came up with out of that. That means, you know, one out of 15 people are attacked and one will pass away, or 19 people will attack and the next one will pass away. So one out of 20 people attacked in Florida actually pass away from the attacks. Um, as far as, you know, no one at fatalities or even large shark attacks in Florida, I don't think you do. Because I can think of, you know, uh, I looked at 2000 forward, there's been five. Five fatalities, one was William Colbert, which they didn't have a body to even look at. They just found his uh, shark bitten gear. Uh, he was spear fishing off of Alligator Reef where I'm about to go back up fishing, uh, back down fishing in a few days here. Uh, the other one, another one is um, Jamie Marie, Marie Daigle, and that was like an eight foot or nine foot bull shark. And she and her friend were out like at a second sandbar, so they were pretty far away from shore when that one happened. Uh, but not a you know a great white type attack. Another one was uh, Schaefer that was on the the what do you call that kite board or whatever. Um, that was multiple sharks and it sounded like smaller sharks than we would normally deal with, um, but never really got a satisfactory idea of what size sharks had bitten into him because you know they don't get into that very much that's when i might uh ask for a coroner's report on to see that myself because they'll say in there what they have and i don't think that anybody's really delved into his attack so um that's what made me look into this in the first place so is that in florida coroner's reports are public information so i decided that i'm going to go after all the coroner's reports i can find there and I, there's only going to be five and two of them are bodies disappeared in Wapnarski and, and Culvert, so that leaves three. Two of those they call invalid, so that leaves one. So if you're a Florida marine biologist, you really don't have a lot of fatalities you're looking at. If you have five uh, in, in 20 years and two of those disappeared, <laughs> you don't know much. And we'll go over to California now. California has had 228 attacks unprovoked. Um, on record and 22 deaths. So out of Florida and California, you have a total of 70 deaths between the two. Um, 22 is a lot less than I thought I'd see there. And uh, that means it's one out of every 10 attacks. So you're talking 10% there, 5% over in there. So you're talking about a six or 7% off of the two main places on the mainland that are attacks happening in the US. 6% uh, fatality rate. Now, if we go other places, now that would kind of explain to me why I hear some of the stuff I hear out of them. They just don't know. It's like they're just thinking about the U.S. and everybody else doesn't matter. You go over to Australia, there's 1,028 attacks. There's more attacks in Australia as a country than there are in Florida, just, you know, by 50 or so. But the, the fatalities where you have 49 in Florida, out of their thousand attacks, out of the thousand attacks over in Australia, you have 229 fatalities. And that's with unknowns and other things sitting out there, just 229 that we know of. So uh, a lot more than both California and, and Florida combined. You go over to South Africa, 411 attacks, but there's 100 deaths there, more than both of those combined again in South Africa. New Zealand has 98 attacks and 30 of them are fatal. You're talking a 30% rate there. 
Uh, Brazil, same thing, 98 attacks, I believe it's 28 deaths, almost 30% there. I know the med that's over 70% fatality because over 50% they don't find a thing. So uh, if, you're, if you're talking to people about fatal shark attacks, the last place you want to talk is to somebody in the U.S. because they're probably not traveling around the world checking on these sharks. If you're stationed in Florida, you don't even have an opportunity to see them. Uh, large whites anyway, you, know, you can see what, three of them in 22 years. So you don't have a lot to even look at at fatalities in Florida. And over in California, you know, like I said, the bites to the boards are gonna keep those numbers down and it keeps it all the way down at one to 10 uh, because that's why it's so low there is all those boards being hit by, by great whites that are not intending to eat you. So I thought that was fascinating because I wanted to, like I said, I wanted to see how many potential things I could look at to see if I'm hearing correct information. Right now it seems Schaefer on that kite board. I could get his maybe. Uh, Jamie Marie Daigle, I think that they covered that one pretty good. So I don't even think that there's much that I can even do to check on their reporting. Um, one fatality I can look into. The other two, uh, Lovnarski and him, they don't have a body. So that's that's uh, some numbers for you. I thought that it would be interesting about how many deaths, you know, what percentage. I mean, you have 6% in America off their two biggest beaches in, or places known for attacks, you're at 6% and then you go elsewhere and it's four to six times that. Um, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are we talking to these people here? Marine biologists here don't know half what people over in Australia would do. You know, I have a fatality from a great white. There's one place I would talk to, maybe two. Uh, my, my buddy's over in Australia and my buddy's over in South Africa. And I would go talk to New Zealand and Brazil before I'd ever talk to a marine biologist in America about this, even one named uh, Ralph Collier. I'm going to put together the Collier files, by the way, and the, that way I'll have something to reference in case I ever have the opportunity to talk to that guy. Uh, that's the only person I, I want to talk to. If H. David Balvich was around, I'd want to talk to him. Uh, he's not, so I want to talk to Collier and find out why all this is going on when he worked with H. David Balvich back in the day. I think it's criminal what he's doing. It's just garbage. So uh, that's our, our covering of stats, and we're going to get into... Uh, real quick, uh, what were you thinking? Over in South Carolina, off of Morris Island, off the north side of Morris Island in 1933, June, I do believe, um, Drayton Hasey is in the water. He's 15 years old. Sounds like he's not too far off of shore. And he says he looks north of him. Well, he looks down the beach, and in the water, he sees what he thinks is a large shark fin. So, you see a large shark fin, you're in that water, and you see that shark down there. I would think most people are going to get out of the water, or go at least up into, you know, ankle deep water, and just take a look at what's happening. And if we want to go check it out, you get out of the water, walk down there, or you walk in the, in the waves that are just coming up on the shore. But no, he walks in the water to go check out what, to see if he saw a shark. So he walks to where he saw the shark fin, still in the water, and uh, he says he gets there and he can't see no shark. So he says he thinks it probably was just a curling wave. And now he tells himself, and he tells an investigator back then that, you know, I didn't want to be swimming around if a shark was in the area. So he sat down in three feet of water. <laughs> Sitting in three feet of water shortly after that, of course, a shark comes up and bites him in the right, lit, right knee. So the shark's got his right knee, and he's in like three feet of water. So he's trying to beat this off. He says he took his free leg, and he's kicking at it with that, probably hitting it with his hands also, and trying to make his way back to the beach. And finally, the kicks get the shark to release his knee, and it releases his right knee, and it bites him in the left leg before he can get himself free and up onto the beach. He gets up onto the beach, and he survives this attack. Um, no explanation as to who got him in or how he was treated. Um, just information on the attack, but I mean, you know, what were you thinking going down there looking for a shark in the water when you saw the shark in the water, but why aren't you thinking when you sit down in the water? That just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, so, you know, you got to love men. They're the, the gift that keeps on giving to this show. And that's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you join me in a few more days for a show of attacks. But until then, if you go into that water, you are much more afraid of those sharks than they are of you.